Good morning, everyone. This is Liz Popwell. I am thrilled today to host this live stream and talk with some of our experts here at Stony Brook Medicine about the future of medicine, uh, specifically about prevention, nutrition, and lifestyle, and how they improve both quality of life and length of life. Um, I'm joined today with three of our experts, and I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves to you. Raja, would you like to go first? Sure. Hi. Good morning. I'm Raja Jaber. I'm a family physician at Stony Brook in the Department of Family Population Preventive Medicine. And I've been um, practicing family medicine for many years and have done integrative medicine. And more recently, the past 10 years, a lot of lifestyle medicine that I teach, practice, and, uh, and hopefully create more programs related to it. Great. Thank you. Iris, would you like to go next? Hi, good morning. I'm Iris Granick. I'm the chair of this Department of Family Population and Preventive Medicine. And my specialty is general preventive medicine and, and public health. And I'm very interested in this area and also how we can teach our, our residents and our medical students about this field. Great, thank you. How about Josie? Would you like to go next? Sure, I'm Dr. Josephine Connolly Sconin. I'm a registered dietitian and I've been at Stony Brook for about 30 years. And during that time, I've had the pleasure of working with Raja and running some ac academic programs with her and uh, collaborating on patient care as well. And I run some of our academic programs as well. Great, thank you so much. So as you know, uh, we've got an esteemed group from Stony Brook Medicine, several experts on the phone, or excuse me, on the web today. Um, I'd like to start with um, Iris, and I'd like for her to share a little bit about the difference between preventative medicine and lifestyle medicine and how they're related. Okay, I, thank you. They're very much related. First of all, just the term preventive medicine is a physician specialty. So just like we can talk about OBGYN or other pediatrics, these are residency-based specialties. So preventive medicine is a residency-based specialty that focuses on training in health promotion and disease prevention, but looking at it both from how you would take care of an individual patient, but also looking at communities and populations. Um, lifestyle medicine is a medical approach that uses evidence-based behavioral interventions to prevent, treat, manage, and reverse chronic disease. And it's become a very big component of the preventive medicine training. Uh, the professional organizations for preventive medicine and the College of Lifestyle Medicine, they work very closely together in some of these trainings. It's one thing I just want to really point out and is that when what's going to come up later too, that changing behavior is not an easy thing. So there are also techniques related to um, motivating behavior change, and that's also part of the training in preventive medicine. And one last thing, if we look at one of the biggest areas like risk for premature death or early death, what are some of the contributors to that? And individual behaviors actually contributes 40% to the risk of early death. Other things that are important are social, economic, and environmental factors can contribute 20%, genetics 30%, but our current health care only 10%. And I think that's because it's real focused on disease treatment as opposed to health promotion. Wow, those are some amazing statistics. I'd like to turn to um, the Time Magazine article recently. I, I love the fact that they did a special edition on um, several of these topics. And Raja, you were actually quoted in there, and I, I was so excited to see our participation in that discussion. Can you talk a little bit about lifestyle medicine and what that means for the future of medicine? Yes, of course. Uh, it's so close to my heart, so I will speak about it. Um, so um, lifestyle medicine um, is um, a new specialty, um, which is going to become hopefully part of all primary care um, uh, specialties in the future, because um, the current system of uh, just treating chronic diseases is kind of a treadmill that is leading to more and more um, uh, costs in medicine and more and more diseases as well. Um, so right now, um, the cost of treating um, uh, our general medical cost in the country is 4.1 trillion. That's how much we spend on healthcare costs. And 90% of these healthcare costs go to treating chronic diseases. Um, so it's a huge expense. And, um, and the problem is that, and if we can go to the first slide about uh, um, the lifestyle medicine pillars, um, the, the core of health has to do with 
what we eat, movement, if we can relax and let go and become more aware of what's happening, if we sleep well, if we have good social connection and care about each other, and if we develop healthy patterns of behavior. And that's what Iris was referring to, really changing behavior. So these core characteristics, if we actually do them, we are, um, and, and unfortunately, only 3% of our general population actually eat a very healthy, uh, very heavy in vegetables and fruits and plant protein diet with very little red meat and very little sugar. Um, so 3% of our population eat that diet, exercise regularly, meaning at least 150 minutes a week, um, sleep well, don't smoke. Um, and if we were to do that, um, then we can prevent up to 90% of diabetes, 80% of heart disease and strokes, and 40% of cancers. I mean, this is kind of astounding, right? It's, a, it's an amazing achievement. And, and the problem in the current system of medicine is that we, in the past, we were only focused on disease and not on the promotion of health. And these pillars that I mentioned are actually the pillars of health. And medicine is shifting, actually. We are introducing more and more of these in the various curriculum across medical schools, but we have a long way to go. Because if we do introduce them, not only do we prevent disease, but we also increase our life expectancy. So currently in the US, even though we spend more money than any other country in the, on earth, uh, our life expectancy is actually the 46th in the globe. Uh, so it's kind of astounding, right? And a lot of this as bec is because of uh, lifestyle issues and also access to care. Um, and if we were to adopt, and there's actually recent research produced many times, if we were to adopt these healthy pillars, and in particular, not smoking, no excessive substance, in particular, alcohol diminishing that, um, exercising regularly, eating a unprocessed, mostly plant-based diet, um, without any harmful fats and sugars and processed food. If we did that, we can prolong our life by 10 years. And 10 years, not only longer life, but free of disease. And that's what we want. We don't want to have a longer life where we are in and out of hospitals or in a nursing home. We want to live and live very healthily. And I have to say, when I work with my patient as they get older and they have more time to take care of themselves, um, and that's another story that we unfortunately are so busy, many of us don't take care of ourselves. But when people get older and have more time and adopt this lifestyle, they actually get younger. I have my older patient telling me I haven't felt as good in all my life. It's because they adopted lifestyle. That's really what makes a quality of life better and um, a life more meaningful. So that's why lifestyle medicine is so important. Thanks, Raja. It's, it's it's interesting you say that. I actually have a friend who uh, retired recently and she said her new job is to take care of her health and she's adopted a lot of behavior and lifestyle changes um, as a result. So I, I, I've seen that uh, with individuals and, and what benefits that can have for individuals. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about behavior change because behavior change is so hard for individuals. And I know there's a lot of science behind that. So uh, talk a little bit about uh, behavior and how does lifestyle medicine address behavior changes? Sure. And uh, maybe you can see slide four um, just to kind of encourage us to change behavior. Um, and, uh, and that slide comes from our website, the lifestyle medicine website, which we've developed and you can uh, zoom on here. But that's true. I mean, uh, that is actually the real core. And thanks, Aries, for bringing it up at the beginning. A lot of people know what to do. I mean, actually, what I told you is pretty evident to most people. Yes, eat better, exercise, sleep better, don't smoke. But then how do you do it? Right. And that's the really, really hard part. Now, I like to answer that question with two ways. One, in order to change behavior, you have to have a context that helps you. If you're the only one trying to change behavior and everybody around you is really stuck on really a not very healthy behavior, it's really hard. Um, that's why it, the context is so important. And the context is not in the clinic, right? I mean, the clinic is a little bit place where we meet people occasionally, but it's a family, it's a community where you live. And that context should also offer you accessible places to exercise, time to exercise, um, enough money to buy healthy food and to, enough time to cook it. Um, so when people are really poor, 
they don't have access, uh, there's not enough safety, um, they're working two jobs, and they really can't embrace a healthy lifestyle. So that is key, and we need a lot of public health program and public policy to change that, and hopefully we can do it eventually in our country because it's vital. The other part of changing behavior is the science of changing behavior on an individual level. So the science um, can really be broken down, broken down into many steps, and we teach that in, in our medical schools and our courses, um, and psychologists teach that, and there are apps now like the Noom app, which is based on the science. Um, so the science is about, first of all, developing awareness, awareness of who you are, what you're doing, the impact of what you're doing on you, um, and the impact that you have that what you're doing on others as well. And that awareness has to be kind, has to be gentle, um, not harsh, not vicious, not vindictive. Because uh, many people want to change behavior, and then they work really hard. They, before a wedding, they lose a lot of weight, and then they go to a barbecue, and they eat poorly, and they say, oh, I can't do it. I, I failed and they start eating very poorly. An exception leads to a complete change in behavior because they start getting vindictive on, their, about, on themselves, being harsh on themselves. I'm a failure. I can't do it. I can never do it. It's all or none for me. That kind of dialogue is very um, not conducive to behavior change. So kindness, gentleness is very important. Accepting that there are steps and we take small goals and small steps and do it gradually. And we always allow for exceptions. Pleasure is important in life. Pleasure often is linked to exceptions. Even though a healthy diet is very pleasurable as we do it, we realize how much pleasure we develop that way. But we also have little hang-ups on the other pleasures. And so having these exceptions makes it possible. Um, otherwise, it is not possible and people fail over and over again. Um, and then there are techniques to motivate people, and we teach that motivational techniques as well. And the techniques to motivate have to do really with meaning. Like, why is this meaningful to me? Why, why is it important for me to move better? And um, some people, it's just because they want to crawl with their grandchildren. They want to play with their grandchildren on the floor. For other people, it's because they don't want to develop dementia, like their parents. And that is really important. The first step not to develop dementia is to exercise, to move move a lot. So personalization is very important, making it mean, meaningful, having a purpose behind it is part of the main motivation techniques that we use to help people change behavior. That's wonderful. Great examples for everyone and, and easy uh, sounding examples, but again, very difficult. I, I think you're right as, as far as creating those behaviors and patterns. Uh, before we move to the next question, I just want to remind the audience that uh, we do have a QR code. If you would like to uh, pop a question in the chat or use the QR code to submit a question, we'd be happy to take questions from the audience and um, address those the best we can throughout the next few minutes. The next question we have is related to what are the specific lifestyle initiatives that we have here at Stony Brook Medicine? We've got quite a few programs and, and um, a lot of experts in this space. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. So Raj, if I can hop on and um, expand on what you were just talking about in terms of behavior change. So we have our target fitness program and it is a weight management program, but we call it target fitness because it's not just about weight management. It really is um, helping patients to understand how to shift and using the techniques that you just discussed, change their relationship with food and shift to a healthier style of eating. You know, as you noted, most people do know the basics of nutrition, like broccoli is healthy and french fries aren't healthy. But there's so much food in the marketplace that is um, unclear. Like what do, what do patients make of a um, plant-based processed burger? I think a lot of foods are, um, by big food industry, created synthetic foods and then marketed in a way that makes it very confusing for people to understand whether they're contributing to health or not. So the target fitness programs do... Um, and we have some different ones for GI health, for cardiometabolic health, um, and overall for weight management. But they do incorporate all of the fabulous techniques that you were just talking about, including mindfulness, self-awareness, positive self-talk, understand where you're at now, and how to, as you said, kindly, gently um, 
have a conversation with yourself when mm -hmm. you're making food choices and eating about the quality of the food and also um, being very mindful of how hungry or full you are and responding appropriately to that. So it, uh, the, the techniques you were discussing are so important. And I just think with food, it can become very complex for patients to craft a healthy eating style because the food marketplace has gotten to be so confusing. That's good. Jesse, can you also talk a little bit about our, <clears throat> excuse me, nutrition counseling services? Sure. So uh, if we go to slide five, if you Google, um, if you uh, just Google Stony Brook Nutrition Therapy, you'll get to this website. So we have a variety of different programs. We have individual counseling um, that's provided by a number of RDs, including myself in the Family Practice Center. And then we have these group programs, as I mentioned. We also have some special packages like sports nutrition uh, packages as well, and some culinary classes. We do a kids cooking uh, program in the summer, and we hope to expand on our culinary classes. Um, and in addition, we have our women, uh, our WIC pro program, Women, Infant, and Children, Children Supplemental Food and Nutrition Program. And one of the really fabulous things about that program is that it really helps to support women in breastfeeding, which we know establishes initial healthy gut, healthy um, physiology for infants. So we're very proud of our WIC program. We have four sites in Suffolk County. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Raja, would you like to talk a little bit more about the pillars and go into a little more detail about that? Yes, sure, and uh, can we show slide three again? So um, uh, so it, we have our lifestyle medicine uh, website and in this website, we have all the pillars. Um, so um, I think there is a, a slide six that we have to go through now. Um, and uh, yeah, so for example, in the food resources, we had the target fitness that uh, Josie was talking about, but we have a lot of local food resources also, and a lot of community farming that we refer to. We also have like a great diabetes prevention program locally that is also referenced in our website that very few people use and is helpful at preventing um, the development of diabetes. Um, and then if we go to our uh, movement and uh, um, and walk with a dog uh, a slide, which is a uh, slide eight. Um, and we have a lot of programs in Stony Brook to help people move because we know that the next uh, pillar is movement. And, you know, there is no life without movement. Our heart beats and that's the first movement. And we vibrate as everything in our in ourselves vibrates. So sitting is very toxic. Sitting is a new smoking. And as you have heard that uh, sentence uh, said over and over again, and we can decrease our risk for chronic diseases tremendously. Actually, the biggest drop is when we move to com from complete sedentary life to a little bit of movement. And that actually is an amazing impact. So like an hour a week only would make a huge impact on our health. Um, so, and, and it's movement can be anything, can be dancing, can we just put music and dance. You don't have to do formal movements, but, but movement is uh, ideally to, for us to be healthy as we, as we get older, has to have all the components like just uh, fitness, uh, aerobic burst of energy, like sudden run, sudden jump, um, strengthening to so get muscle mass, increase our muscle mass because that helps in preventing diabetes, that depends in making us stronger and not fall as we get older, uh, balance programs. And at Stony Brook, we have an amazing Tai Chi program that you can also link to by going to our website as well. And that Tai Chi program is, for, is free um, and it's available on Zoom as well. And, um, and you can um, uh, enjoy multiple classes. Uh, Christy Ledowski has created a really a nationwide program by that, uh, if, I can, if I may say, because people can join from wherever. And Tai Chi has been found to decrease falls in the elderly. It's a very slow movement based on a very old um, Chinese tradition of uh, martial arts. Um, and it creates much better balance and it's also very calming. Uh, stretching is very important. So all the components of movement and in our website as well, we have also um, a place where you can go to if you have back pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, all these things that actually stop people from exercising and are so preventable with good strengthening programs. So we can age gracefully and stay strong and fit uh, with movement. 
And the other component uh, that we have at Stony Brook is a, a great uh, mind-body component. Uh, so we have a wonderful um, program to uh, help with sleep. Um, because as you uh, have heard, again, in sleep has become, I think, now the big one coming to the limelight that uh, we need to sleep well to keep our brain functioning as we get older. And we have now a um, epidemic of what we call sleep apnea, uh, where people just stop sleeping, uh, sorry, stop breathing in their sleep, um, often linked to snoring and heavy weight, but not necessarily, but that's the main component is our obesity epidemic. And unfortunately now it's like nearly 40% of the population which is obese, which is really big. So we have that epidemic um, and that stopping sleeping um, is harmful, decreases oxygen to our brain. And by decreasing oxygen to our brain, increases the risk of heart disease, strokes, dementia as we get older, but also puts stress on the rest of our body, heart disease, diabetes, cancers, everything increases with sleep apnea and also with a short amount of sleep, meaning if we sleep, not enough. And because if we don't sleep enough, we don't consolidate memory um, and our, all our memory pathways are disrupted. We can't create new memories. Um, in addition to having a higher cortisol level and more inflammation in our body. So we have a great cognitive behavioral therapy program for insomnia at Stony Brook. And we also have a great sleep lab. And that cognitive behavior therapy program is very uh, good to teach people how to sleep, uh, how to create an ambiance to fall asleep easily and to stay asleep. And Dr. O'Brien is a psychology who leads that program. We have a great mind-body clinical research center at Stony Brook where we have programs also to help people stick to healthy lifestyle in a psychological fashion. It's called the SMART program, um, which has to teach people motivation and resilience and to um, to deal with stress to eat better to exercise and we have in the in the community and again in our uh, website we go to our local resources and also virtual on the web we have mind body um, mind mind body stress reduction program mindfulness based stress reduction program and mindfulness is really presence awareness and these are eight weeks program that are so helpful to help with anxiety depression stress um, and all kinds of chronic diseases and insomnia. So um, I'm really happy uh, that we have all of these things. And we have also the last pillar on our website describing everything you can do to help you change behavior from websites to programs on, on the island to help people with substance abuse or alcohol intake, as well as to um, help people just stick to change behavior in general for smoking cessation and any other things, in fact, and teach mindfulness, presence, which is actually the core to changing behavior. That's key. Unless we have that awareness, non-judgmental of what we, do, what we do moment to moment, behavior change is very hard. So that's really what we have and, uh, and that's what we offer. That's great. I, I also love the fact that we have some mindfulness and meditation uh, programs at Stony Brook for our employees as well. I know we've got um, a specific right. room for rest and respite, you know, to get away um, and, and have some um, ability to to be mindful and to spend time um, as needed. And then we also have meditation and other uh, virtual options that we offer for our employees as well, which I think is amazing. Um, I do want to switch switch now to a question that came in from one of our viewers. And the question says, are strength training or cardio exercises better as you age? Isn't it true that your body stops building muscle at a certain age? Well, uh, I'll say something and then maybe Josie want to add. Um, both are very important as we age. Um, uh, cardio exercises and strength training. And actually both of them help decrease the risk for diabetes because some people think it's only like walking or going on a treadmill or doing elliptical and raising your heart rate. But no, actually strength training and developing muscle ma mass also decreases the risk for diabetes. And as I said, improve your odds not to fall and to be strong. And no, it's it is wrong. We can continue to build muscles and to make new muscle as we age. Um, there are certain 
ways that you have to do it. You have to have a certain amount of protein, a minimal amount of protein, not too much, but you have to have that first and you have to have proper strength training um, and you can build muscle as you age. Actually, we've seen that even in 90 year olds. Yeah. The research does support that. And um, it is important nutritionally to have enough protein. But like you said, that's very easy to do. But one of the best things you could do for yourself is to enter older age with a larger muscle mass. That is very, that helps you with resilience when you get sick. So strength training is equally as important as cardiovascular. And it's just, you can, you really do have to learn how to strength train appropriately and, and in a um, appropriate technique so you don't hurt yourself. But as Raja mentioned, there's lots of resources for that. Great. Thanks, Josie. We also have another question on the topic of meditation, which I think is great. Um, <clears throat> this particular question says, on the topic of meditation, it doesn't really work or relax someone if you don't buy into it. How would you recommend somebody shift their mindset to really believe in meditation and its benefits? That's a great question. And I also have a lot of my patients tell me I can't meditate because my mind always is racing. I can't I can't empty my mind. I can't meditate. And I tell them meditation is not about emptying the mind. Emptying the mind may happen as a side effect. Meditation is really a way of honing your focus as well as it's like uh, building a muscle. But at the same time, crucially, is a way of getting to know yourself. So um, if what you learn is that you can't sit still and you're restless. You're learning that, that you are a restless person, that you can't sit still. And that's okay. Kindness, again, kindness. Oh, I'm a restless person. I can't concentrate. I can't focus. That's okay. So then you can let go, let it go of that thought, of that, of that awareness, and then come back to the focus. And then realize again that you lost your focus. And that constant realization of who we are and what we're doing and developing that kindness as we do it transforms ourself and in a way that actually leads to a lot of good things that we want to achieve. So, Great. Thank you so much for that. We also had a question about uh, the live stream and if they can come back and rewatch the video. So just um, for awareness for our, our viewers, yes, we are recording this. It will be available on YouTube, so you can absolutely come back. And um, I know we're sharing a lot of detailed information. So if you want to come back and revisit some of the topics today, that will absolutely be available for you uh, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and on LinkedIn. And I want to say something about meditation is because people don't realize um, why it's important. But and so on our website, we do talk about <coughs> the effect of meditation because it does really change, it decrease our cortisol level, blood pressure, heart rate, decrease our cardiac risk, help us sleep better, also decreases inflammation in our body. So it is a lot of effect of it, meditation, which are scientifically proven. Raj, I'm not sure how you would feel about this before our questioner. I will sometimes do movement meditation, like meditate while I'm exercising, not strenuously, but um, can that fit in? And you think that might help our the person who asked the question, maybe they um, would be able to focus more if they were moving. Absolutely. I think that's a Thank you so much for bringing it up because absolutely meditation can be um, part of anything we do. Uh, I mean, actually really presence, right? Um, so it could be walking meditation, awareness of where we walk or exercise, even running. So being aware of our movement, of our arms, of our legs, of our breathing, of our mind as we run, that's meditation. Oh, and also when we were talking about exercise and the importance of strength training and also cardiovascular, also yoga and, and the kind of yoga where you do spend time stretching and focusing on your joints, which is another important thing. But a large part of real yoga therapy is the breath, you know, and focusing on your breath as you're moving various parts of your body. So it can work on that together very much. And I also, when people, instead of using the term meditation, sometimes using the term focus, where, like Raja was saying, where do you focus your awareness? And even just sitting with somebody for one moment to do five breaths is what I do. It's like focus a little bit with people on taking a slow breath in, holding for my blowing out so that you're helping somebody just change their focus. And after five breaths, they can see that there's already been a change in terms of the level of the activity in their mind. 
That's great. Very helpful tips. I appreciate that. I think I'm going to move on now to education and training activities. We, um, through Stony Brook Medicine and our university, have um, phenomenal life science programs. And, and Iris, I'd like for you to talk a little bit more about some of the, the activities that we do with our residents and um, how, do, how do we provide and um, promote some of these skill building with regard to uh, the students that we that we have on um, in our different programs. Okay, thank you. You know, for our preventive medicine residents, one of the big things that they focus on is the motivational interviewing. So we actually have opportunities for them to do telepreventive medicine visits with patients. And this is a, pre, uh, a free visit where they get to focus on whether or not the patients have gone for their screenings, which is another thing that we haven't brought up yet. Part of behavior is going for your you know, mammographies or going for your colorectal cancer screening. Very important part of prevention. So they focus on that with their uh, with their motivational interviewing techniques. They also work in the smoking cessation clinic at the VA hospital. But with the medical students, I really want to talk about the first year medical student class that I run. It's actually their preclinical course, so it goes for a year and a half. And there we have the students themselves trying to focus on how do they pick goals related to behaviors, related to sleep or, or nutrition or exercise and what goals they set for themselves. And they actually have a coach and their coach is a student that's a year ahead of them. And after every um, major set of courses, while they're taking my course, they set out goals and they write about it and they have their coach as their more senior student working with them on it. And one of the things we talk about is that if you're gonna really wanna help people make these changes or promote a lifestyle, you have to start working on it on yourself so that you can see what it's all about. So this gives them that chance to do that. And also with Raja and Josephine, we have a thing called Nutrition Over Lunch, so that all the students will have this opportunity to meet uh, you know, registered dietitians to see how they can be colleagues in helping with their patients in the future, and also what it's like for themselves to prepare you know, the plant-based uh, whole food kind of diet. That's great. Thank you so much. Roger, would you like to talk a little bit about the um, one of the, some of the courses that we offer? Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, and I want to say that uh, that's walking the talk is so important and we teach it to the medical students and for us as physicians uh, or coaches or nutritionists, um, if we don't walk the talk and actually live the lifestyle that we want to teach, I don't think we're effective at, uh, at portraying it to our patients and, and encouraging them to do it. Um, so we do have uh, the nutrition over lunch and, that, and, and we, we eat together, we talk about food and food preparation and collaborating, which is lovely. We have a, a few other courses. We have a pillar where we talk about the science of lifestyle medicine because people think, oh, it's like, you know, soft medicine, you know, exercising, eating well. Um, and, and I know that, thank you um, also, Iris, for mentioning the plant-based part. So there's a lot of confusion here. And I just want to say briefly that um, a completely plant-based diet um, is an option for people who are very ill, perhaps severely inflamed, or people who believe in it, and, and they can be actually a completely healthy diet. But I think most of the teaching is to is to really shift toward a mostly plant-based diet. And that's really, so it's okay to have some chicken, some fish, decreasing red meat is important because it has other consequences, but to really have a plentiful of lentils and beans and vegetables and fruits and nuts and seeds. Um, so we teach how we change our body eating this diet and how we change our body exercising. And what we, what we are teaching patients is really at the molecular level, at the level of, I mean, our students, at the level of genetic expression, because our genes receive information um, from multiple levels. So from what the food that we eat, uh, the phytonutrients um, actually send information to our genes and, and activate our anti-inflammatory genes and our antioxidant genes and our detoxifying genes. Uh, whereas if we eat like just basic red meat and fat, we do not activate these good genes at all. So there is a gene activation. There's also changing of the molecular milieu of our gut. The microbiome changes are 
different kind of bacteria grow with different food and then send their own signals to the rest of the body, affect all our body biochemistry and affect our gene expression, affect how quickly we have growth, abnormal growth, abnormal blood vessels, cancer spreading based on what we put in our body. Same thing, exercise decreases inflammation. If we exercise regularly, our inflammation goes down, our immune system goes up. Same thing with sleep. Uh, so we teach the physiology and the and the and what we do with and that and then we translate that science into clinical applications. Okay, so when our body changes this way, what happens? How do we prevent dementia, diabetes, depression? Because even depression is linked to what we do in our body. So it's also mental health. Uh, so it's a very exciting course. And then we have other courses which are like a selective, which is a month long course, where it's collaborative. And Josie works with me as well as physical therapists, as well as a psychologist. And we teach people the application of this. Okay, that we cook together. So there's a chef that gives some cooking classes. They take yoga classes. They take exercise classes to know how to strengthen muscles and teach patients to strengthen. Um, they go and do a supermarket tour with Josephine. Um, and uh, they do Tai Chi. Uh, so they essentially know how to apply it and then work on motivation interviewing. And then we do cases. So it's a very exciting course we do. And then we hope to introduce that in the rest of the courses in the medical schools by bits and pieces. So there are medical schools like the University of South Carolina at Greenville, which now has a complete lifestyle medicine curriculum integrated in all throughout day one to until they graduate. So uh, we're doing that. And then uh, we have a very strong lifestyle medicine interest group uh, in the first year and second year. And they do culinary classes and cooking classes together. Um, and we have the residency curriculum in preventive medicine. And hopefully, we will spread that residency curriculum in lifestyle medicine to other residencies like family medicine and, and internal medicine, like other medi uh, others, uh, medical schools are doing uh, across the country. Um, so it's exciting times. A lot of great things going on. I appreciate that. I'd love to hear some more about the nutrition programs, Josie. Can you share a little bit more about those? Sure. It's an exciting time because there's been some um, changes or additions to how you can train to become a registered dietitian. So traditionally, it's been an undergraduate degree, a graduate degree, and a clinical training program. So you kind of had to know from the beginning of your undergraduate career, career that you'd want to do nutrition because it was very hard to get into the field afterwards. You'd have to repeat an undergraduate degree. But now we have programs at the master's level. So if you have an undergraduate degree um, really in any field and you do a number of science prerequisites, we have a new program called our master's in in uh, professional nutrition practice. And here are all the programs on this slide that we offer. And the one in the lower right corner, the MS in professional nutrition practice is a brand spanking new one. And you can um, join that program or you know, enroll, uh, apply for that program um, as long as you just have a certain number of science prereqs and a baccalaureate degree. And then that's a year and a half program where you do your didactic work in nutrition with all the fabulous concepts and um, ideas that Raja just shared about how nutrition impacts every aspect of your physiology, as well as um, critical care in the hospitals and whatnot. So that's, that's exciting news, is that now you can um, enter the field at the graduate level. So we're excited to offer that program. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I know um, we are looking at really expanding um, on a lot of these exciting topics and um, trying to really grow um, what we're doing in this space and really trying to help promote what we're doing in this space. So can we talk a little bit about the growth in the education, uh, the training, even in the research and the clinical services that we're starting to um, evolve? Um, I can share that we're starting to do some uh, new work with very precision controlled feeding studies. So as we've been discussing, nutrition really impacts every aspect of your physiology, but much research has been done by educating patients about what they should eat to be in a study and then measuring outcomes. But, but patients are then left to their own devices to do the food shopping and prepare and try to follow the um, program that is uh, uh, that they're asked to follow. Now we're starting to do studies where we actually prepare all the food that's um, uh, cooked you know, everything's weighed out to the 10th of a gram for every particular patient. We feed them for a number of time, maybe 10 days, two weeks, and then we can measure outcomes. So as Raja was mentioning, the gut microbiome is a very interesting and new, uh, relatively new area of research. So we're doing studies looking at changing diet and the impact that has on the gut microbiome, as well as inflammatory markers and some of the other things that we've been talking about. So in the not too distant future, we hope to have a, a, a 
uh, metabolic kitchen that can really help us to um, advance that research. That's great. Iris, I know you you um, shared with me a little bit earlier about our telepreventative medicine services. Talk a little bit about that and what and what's available for folks out in uh, in the viewership. Yeah. Well, another area related to telepreventive medicine, to, a lot of times people, you know, don't have the, the time to come in for like an annual visit. An annual visit is such an important visit that even Medicare has recognized that now. Years ago, we thought, oh, the annual visit wasn't that necessary. But now we recognize that if you want to focus on lifestyle and health promotion, disease prevention, that's the time that you can really sit down and go over, you know, with the patients, where, where do they want to make changes? what kinds of things you can talk to them about related to that. So we are wanting to expand our telepreventive medicine service that we can make it also telepreventive medicine service for annual visits to have that time to really focus on prevention. Another area that I think is important as we see more and more people complaining, developing long COVID symptoms, uh, what can we do right now? I think lifestyle medicine would be a really important um, feature to help these patients. And we're looking forward to that when we move into a new space that we can have uh, the ability to have more group visits because um, we said that you know when you have uh, people helping each other can really make a difference. So we're looking forward to having more group visits and particularly focusing in the area of research in long COVID. Thank you for that. I, I want to pull on the thread of community because we've talked about um, how important social support systems are in helping change behavior and lifestyle. And I know, Josie, we are doing a lot with regard to the community and healthy eating. So can you talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing in that space? Sure. Some of the most exciting things, I think, are community gardens. So Raja mentioned, and there was a link on the websites that she shared about uh, local um, CSAs, community supported agriculture. So some of those are very community oriented. And sometimes you can work instead of pay to um, be able to partake in the produce that's grown. We have our own Stony Brook Heights rooftop farm, and that's a model uh, micro farm that um, we um, will ex be expanding on and using produce from our farm to distribute in the community largely from, for our patients when they're discharged. But we do do cooking classes on the farm for children and hope to expand that and also to support local community gardens. We partner with um, Suffolk County Food Policy Council and Cornell Cooperative Extension on a program called Double Up Food Bucks. So people that are getting SNAP benefits, they can actually double the amount of money that they can spend on produce. So you spend a dollar on produce, you can you get another dollar to spend on produce. So we have a lot of community partners to help, as Raja mentioned, make eating healthy the default in communities. And um, that's typically not the case. So um, shifting that I think is really, really key. And we've done a lot of work in school districts and continue to support um, farm to school programs on Long Island and send out clinical training students out into um, school districts to do education and um, support plant-based meals in schools, which is really an important thing. One uh, last question from our audience. I, I know we haven't been able to address all of them, but I think this is this ties in. Um, I completely agree and have seen firsthand that support really helps when eating healthy. Is there anything else you can discuss on the topic of dieting and working out with a partner? Hmm. Well, I, I will say cooking in a group, whether it's a partner or a family unit, is um, really helpful in shifting everyone's eating habits. So as Raja mentioned, while we're working and our kids are young, it's a very stressful time, time-wise. So if we're cooking with a partner or cooking with our family and making it a family event and activity, um, and maybe you can't do that every day because people are busy, but one or two nights a week where you do some bulk prepping as a family or with your uh, a single partner, I think is really a, a very social activity and a bonding activity and um, it can really be a lot of fun. And also with friends. Um, so sometimes uh, occasionally with my group of friends, we'll cook and then everyone goes home with a meal for the next day. So it's really important to cook as a family and as a group or with a partner. Great, great advice. Well, we're coming to close um, and the end of our time here. So I'd like to ask each of you to share, you know, one thing that you're doing differently yeah. or one thing that you're doing to um, improve your own health and well-being. So Raja, would you like to go first? 
Yeah, and I just want to have a pitch for also uh, exercising in group and walking in group. And I often ask my patients if they have a partner to walk with. And, you know, we do walk every third Sunday of each month in the Heritage Park at 11 a.m. And that's our Walk with a Dog program um, where you can bring partners and families and people sometimes come with their kids and um, and it's a and and there is a physician who speaks about the topic. So the next time on the 19th of this month, Dr. Korn, Jude Korn is talking about breast cancer, and we will walk at the same time. And you can walk from your home on on Zoom with us if you want to. But I, what am I doing in my own life to 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 improve my health and my lifestyle? For me, what I really need to uh, what I'm doing well is I'm exercising and strengthening, and I eat well. Um, what I'm not doing well and I need to work on is my sleep, uh, is finding enough time to have a good amount of sleep, but actually I'm improving. And I think we all, all of us are, you know, are human beings. Uh, we're not perfect. Mm, right. we, we work on, on, on ourselves and, uh, and that's very important to continue to do so. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Um, uh, Josephine, would you like to go next? So um, for myself, I think as Raja mentioned, as we get older and our kids leave the house, we have more time for ourselves, right? So I've just started to increase my exercise and um, and, and varying it because I'm getting older too, right? So <laughs> I was getting some overuse injuries. So now I'm really trying to do uh, different exercise programs like cycling and um, Pilates and some different things. But that does take time. So um, investing, I'd say in, investing time in your health. Um, you know, I do spend a lot of time either exercising or food prepping. I tell my husband, if the amount of time we spend at our counter chopping vegetables, you know, if we can make money for that, we'd be rich. Um, <laughs> but planning ahead um, for both your exercise the next day and your meals the next day. It doesn't happen, just happen. You know, there is a lot of planning involved. So um, what meals are you putting together or what vegetables can you prepare and chop and have ready for the next day so that you can put healthy meals together quickly? And can I just take a moment? There was a question in mm -hmm. the... Um, in the in the chat. Um, so just in terms of pregnancy, again, our Women, Infant, and Child Supplemental Food Program, we give uh, a lot of advice to women um, regarding healthy eating during pregnancy and in the early years of life and transitioning, you know, breastfeeding and transitioning to um, toddler uh, food. But also in family medicine, I see and counsel pregnant women as well. So that's a service that we offer and you could go on that nutrition therapy, um, just Google Stony Brook Nutrition Therapy and you'll get to a way that you can make an appointment for individual counseling and we can certainly address um, pregnancy and, and infancy. Absolutely. That's great. I know, uh, when I had now my daughter's 20 years old, but I gave up soda, um, and caffeine, but not, not a hundred percent caffeine. I can't say, cause I'm drinking tea right now, but I did give up soda, uh, when I had my daughter and that was a behavior change that stuck with me. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it was hard at first, but like you say, it's once you get on that, on that roll, it's, it's mm -hmm. much easier. Iris, you have such a compelling story, personal story. I, I was wondering if you would share that with everyone. And related to what you were just saying is sometimes something happens to us that really can lead to the motivation to make some changes. So last year I did um, have a bout of breast cancer and I'm fine now, but that was the thing that sort of woke me up that you know I, I wanted to focus on my health more and also to go through the treatments, I needed something to help me focus on. So many things I incorporated, including focusing more on mindfulness, meditation, putting on guided imagery, pop it in a tape when I go to sleep and I would put me right to sleep, but I felt like I was getting positive messages there. Also adding a movement and uh, yoga, kind of gentle movements and making it a routine. But the other thing that had happened prior, prior to me getting the diagnosis, it was during the pandemic. And I think there's you know evidence that many people started having a glass of wine, you know, so I started having the glass of wine every day, you know, for dinner and which hadn't been my habit before. It was more that I would have it on special occasions or on weekends or going out. And there is an association in the literature between certain types of breast cancer and alcohol use. And as a result, I completely got rid of the alcohol and now it really is only for special occasions. So that there are things that sometimes motivate us to say, what can we start doing differently? I also, when we talk about lifestyle, being a workaholic, I, after that, I decided, and we talk about going to sleep, I say no more work after a certain hour. If I work and I come home, I can put that aside now and focus on relaxation and, and getting sleep at the right time and preparing some meals for the next day. 
That's great. I, I really appreciate you sharing your personal story. I I also have a story in my about my husband. He um, he had COVID about we, well, we both had COVID about a year and a half ago. And following that, he had this lung feeling that he thought was just, you know, lingering COVID. And in, he's in his young 50s. And one day he uh, texts me in ER, EKG, OK. And I'm like, OK, which neighbors in the ER? Who are, who are we worried about? He said, no, I am. And this is a man who never likes to go to the hospital or to the doctor and was very healthy, worked out, had, you know, pretty good lifestyle uh, choices. And turns out, um, you know, he's had sleep apnea for many, many, many years and didn't want to address it because what he was worried about the mask and would he feel claustrophobic. And uh, sure enough, he ended up having a, a, a major blockage and had to have a stint placed. And at that time, the doctor talked to us about sleep apnea and sleep habits and how important that is to your health. And that was a big wake up call for for both of us. And I'm, I'm proud to say he now has his uh, CPAP and is very compliant with it. Um, but that's something that really was a big learning for us as far as how sleep can affect your complete health. So I appreciate you all talking about that today. So again, we're at the close of time. Uh, appreciate all the comments, all the questions from the audience. It's been a great discussion. Uh, the discussion doesn't have to end now. Um, please continue. I to, yeah. Liz, I want to say something about COVID because COVID came uh, several times and we talked a lot about chronic diseases, but sure. we didn't talk about acute disease. COVID is an acute disease. And I just want to say that because we, I don't want to leave the public thinking that we only can prevent chronic diseases when we change our lifestyle. Actually, there's good, and good research showing that people who eat a healthy diet, more plant-based, who exercise, tend to get less COVID than others. And if they get it, they get it less severe than others. So that's important to remember that it's not only chronic diseases, but it's also acute illnesses as well that we can change. And especially in the epidemic of all these viral diseases that are happening these days. And, uh, and I agree with Iris about the long COVID, I think, because inflammation is really a huge component in long COVID, and um, that can be changed as well, and hopefully we'll have programs for that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that to give people hope also, not only for chronic diseases. That's wonderful. I appreciate that, Raja. That's that's a great closing comment. I love that um, because COVID is something that's top of mind for a lot of individuals and what are, and we're still learning about all of those effects. So that that's a wonderful closing comment to end on. So thank you to my Stony Brook experts. I appreciate the conversation. It was wonderful today. And again, um, we've got, uh, we'll be publishing this out uh, so folks can come back to it and listen to it. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it.